democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we continue our coverage of the second anniversary of the Syrian uprising, I want to bring Reese Ehrlich into the conversation. Reese is a freelance foreign correspondent who's reported from Syria on several occasions. He's just returned from 10 days in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. I want to play a clip of his report for NPR on Saudi Arabia's involvement in the Syrian conflict. A crowd of men walk slowly out of a working-class mosque after Friday prayers. The mosque's imam has just asked everyone to pray for the Syrian rebels. Worshipper Tahir Mohammed wants to see the overthrow of Bashar al-Assad. Bashar, his army is make it all kind of crime. Yes, of course, I, I support the revolution. Mohammed says he also supports Saudis going to fight in Syria. Dozens of Facebook pages memorialize Saudis killed in Syria. Late last year, a judge in one Saudi city told young anti-government protesters that they should be fighting jihad in Syria, not demonstrating at home. Reached by phone, Abdul Rahman al-Talq, father of one of the defendants, recalls what the judge said. The judge said you should save all your energy and fight against the real enemy, the Shia Muslims in Syria, and not fight inside Saudi Arabia. Within weeks, 11 of the 19 defendants left to join the rebels. In December last year, al Talk's son was killed in Syria. That's Reese Ehrlich's report on NPR from uh, Saudi Arabia. He joins us now from San Francisco. And still with us in studio is Reem Turkmani, a member of the Syrian Civil Democratic Alliance meeting in New York at the uh, United Nations with various staffs of Security Council members discussing possible political solutions to the situation in Syria. Syria. Reese, uh, you're just back from Syria, t uh, from Saudi Arabia. Tell us what you found. Well, <clears throat> I was there on assignment for NPR and for Global Post. What I found was that the, excuse me, <clears throat> the Saudi government and wealthy Saudis are uh, involved in uh, arming Syrian rebels, the most ultra conservative, uh, ultra religious groups such as Al Nusra. Uh, and that uh, hundreds of Saudis are uh, infiltrating across the borders from Jordan and uh, Turkey and going to fight with these extremist groups in Syria. What is Saudi Arabia's interest? Well, the Saudis uh, want to see a pro-Saudi government emerge. Uh, the analysts I spoke to in Saudi Arabia point to what they call the Yemen model, where there was an Arab Spring uprising, the head of the government was replaced, but a pro-Western, pro-Saudi general uh, replaced the old guy. So they'd love to see that happen in Syria. But as my sources pointed out, it's not going to happen because Syria is very, very different from Yemen. And, and Reem, your, your reaction in terms of the historic relationships between Saudi Arabia and Syria? Uh, <clears throat> As we all know, Saudi Arabia is not a democratic country. The uprising started to reach a democratic Syria. So uh, I don't have faith in any undemocratic country to support democratic transition inside Syria. I'm not surprised that they are supporting the armed uh, rebels and uh, increasing the level of violence in Syria. Uh, however, we are very confident that violence never, ever leads to democracy. So uh, as much as I oppose the regime, my group opposes the regime, we, we oppose also this offers from Saudi Arabia to turn Syria into a jihadi land. I mean, the Syrians are, their mentality is very, very different from like the jihadi extreme Muslims mentality. And I think they will find it very difficult to market their ideas inside Syria. However, the violence is giving them the right environment, fertile environment for such um, uh, ideology uh, to spread. I fear that uh, these efforts are damaging the relationship between the Saudi and the Syrian people. I mean, many Syrians now inside Syria, let's say, especially in the more stable parts, feel very strongly uh, about the uh, uh, Saudi uh, approach and uh, uh, support to extremism. It's even in the media. I mean, they, they host many uh, sectarian media stations and they keep repeating you know as we heard this is a Shia against Sun Sunni uh, war and we have to win it and you know we uh, 
I'm a Syrian, I grew up in Syria. I didn't know my sect until I was 20 years old, and it's never been an issue for us. The people who demonstrated two years ago, they did not demonstrate because they are Sunni or Shia. Uh, so we, their efforts to turn this into a Shia-Sunni confrontation are certainly not welcome. Earlier this month, the Saudi foreign minister, uh, Saud al-Faisal, explained his country's position in Syria. He was speaking in Riyadh at a joint news conference following talks with Secretary of State John Kerry. As for providing enough aid and security for uh, the Syrians, uh, Saudi Arabia will do everything within its, uh, its capabilities to help in this. We do believe that what is happening in Syria is a slaughter, a slaughter of innocent people. And we just can't bring ourselves to remain quiet in front of this. Uh, this carnage. We cannot bring ourselves to remain silent, um, uh, quiet in front of this carnage. Reese Ehrlich, your response? It's a little rather hypocritical. Saudi Arabia sent troops to repress the uh, carnage going on in uh, Bahrain uh, a year ago, well, now two years ago. Uh, the Saudi Arabia has its uh, political, economic, military interests in the region. It supports the repressive monarchies. Uh, it doesn't like the Assad regime, uh, but it got along perfectly well with the uh, Egyptian and Tunisian dictatorships. So, uh, to say the least, Saudi Arabian uh, officials are being hypocritical. And 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 Reese, in terms of the of uh, well earlier, uh, in terms of the the other countries in the region and their and their attitude toward uh, support for the Syrian resistance. Uh, what's your sense of uh, other countries and their particular interests other than Saudi Arabia? Well, Turkey, of course, has been a very strong supporter. Uh, most of, I've now traveled to almost all the countries that have undergone Arab Spring uprisings over the last year or two. And the uh, Syria still remains a popular uprising, despite all the very serious problems that the country's going through. And people do support popular uprisings. Uh, what I think people, uh, I think the exception would be Iran, uh, which has heavily backed Assad and uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, has heavily backed uh, Assad. But with those exceptions, um, there's not a lot of support for the Assad government. And um, you know, people, uh, what's happened is the longer the uprising has taken place and the harsher the repression from Assad, the more foreign powers have gotten involved, each trying to get their guy into power. And in the case of the U.S., the U.S., you know, the debate in the U.S. is whether, well, should we bomb them, should we create a no-fly zone and arm the rebels and take a more militant stand, or should we continue kind of the Obama policies of secretly arming the uh, and covertly arming and training the guerrillas. The problem is the reason this has not been resolved, as pointed out to me by a Muslim Brotherhood leader that I interviewed in Istanbul, is that the U.S. hasn't found a leader that it can trust to pursue its interests. Uh, if you recall, in the case of Iraq or Afghanistan, there was a guy the U.S. promoted as the new Democrat, uh, supposedly, who turned out to be otherwise. But uh, they haven't found that guy yet in Syria, and that's one of the reasons that they're taking uh, less than um, militant stand in support of the Syrian rebels. I want to play another clip uh, from your report in NPR that features Mohammed al Qatani, the Saudi Civil and Political Rights Association. On Saturday, al Qatani was sentenced at least to 10 years in prison for offenses that included sedition and giving inaccurate information to foreign media. At a human rights meeting in Riyadh, participants discussed Saudi involvement in Syria. Mohammed al Qatani, an activist and professor at the Institute of Diplomatic Studies, says the judge's remarks reflect a government effort to undercut domestic protest. Diffuse um, the pressure, domestic pressure, by recruiting young kids to go and join another proxy war in the region. Don't participate in an Arab Spring in Saudi Arabia. Go to Syria and do it there. Oh, that's exactly the case. Qatani says most of the youth join ultra-conservative rebel groups such as the al-Nusra Front. The U.S. State Department has designated al-Nusra a terrorist organization. Make no mistake, these folks definitely are against democracy and human rights and so on and so forth. So you have to be really careful because it could backfire. 
the ramification could be quite serious in the, re- in the whole region. Saudi Arabia does not allow any uh, Saudis to get involved in any other uh, internal affairs. It's illegal. Major General Mansour al-Turki is spokesperson for the Saudi Ministry of Interior. Anybody who wants to travel actually outside Saudi Arabia in order uh, to get involved in such conflict, he will be arrested and prosecuted. But only if we have the evidence before actually he leaves the country. Critics say the government doesn't try very hard to find such evidence. Professor Katani says meddling in the Syrian civil war hurts the entire region. Once foreigners are involved, there's going to be mercenaries leading the, leading the war. It could give excuse, if you will, for the Syrian regime that these are foreign mercenaries fighting, which is a wrong policy to do. That was Professor Mohammed al Qatani. Since you interviewed him, Reese Ehrlich, in Saudi Arabia, he was sentenced to at least 10 years in prison for charges that include sedition and giving inaccurate information to foreign media. Um, can you talk about the point he made and his case? And was he imprisoned for what he had to say, his criticism of Saudi Arabia supporting fighters in Syria? Yeah, he was one of the main researchers in Saudi Arabia looking into that question. I attended a Monday night uh, seminar, if you will, of human rights activists where he delivered a talk on exactly that topic. Um, He's been uh, under uh, uh, arrest uh, and out of jail and in jail for a while. It's hard to know in the opaque Saudi judicial system exactly what you're charged with or what you're convicted of, uh, other than these vague charges about uh, spreading false information to the um, international media and so on. He speaks a lot to not only to me but to other foreign reporters, and uh, they're sending him to jail as an effort to stop that information flow. It's outrageous. He was doing nothing more than what uh, an analyst uh, would do in the United States from. from Uh, studying a question, looking into it, and uh, providing information to reporters. It's just a sign of how repressive the U.S. ally Saudi Arabia is. On the substance of it, uh, he has pointed out that there is continuing unrest inside Saudi Arabia. It's not as uh, widespread as it is in other countries, but it's there, particularly in the eastern province, which is mostly Shia. There's uh, regular demonstrations taking place, and the government seeks to divert that popular discontent by telling people, well, don't fight here, go to Syria. That's where you can really carry out jihad. And some people go for it. And and Reem Turkmani, the influence of these jihadi uh, fighters from abroad into uh, into the civil war in Syria, you've got the the jihadist armed rebels, you've got the secular armed rebels, and then you've got the nonviolent resistance, democratic resistance that you represent. On the ground, what does it mean? I mean, there's some areas where reports of Sharia courts have already been set up uh, in rebel-held areas, and the the impact of that on the existing uh, institutions of Syrian society. Indeed. Um, Right now, internationally, uh, the tendencies or everybody is talking about political solution. And you hear even uh, uh, the UK and the US, even though they're supporting a little bit the army, they're still talking about political solution. Political solution means that we have to talk to all these armed people, all the armed group, and bring them to a negotiation table. I trust we can bring the Syrians, we can bring those who defected from the army or those who thought they were carrying arms to defend their families. However, the jihadists are going to be impossible. They are going to be the real obstacle to any peace process in Syria. Their cause is global. It's not for democracy, certainly. Uh, Even if the regime falls tonight, they're going to continue their fight. Uh, They're not interested in any negotiations and any peace deal. And their threat is not going to be contained inside Syria. It's certainly going to affect the whole region. This is why we have to act very quickly to end this war and bring together a peaceful solution for all the Syrians. It has to be all-inclusive to bring all the Syrians into a negotiation table to reach a peaceful solution towards a democratic Syria. We're not interested in any project that doesn't lead eventually to a democratic country. And finally, uh, Reese Ehrlich, um, just to shift gears a bit, you also visited Bahrain. Um, and on the second anniversary of the Saudi invasion of Bahrain, sending in troops there, can you talk about the situation right now? 
Sure. Bahrain is now the longest running Arab Spring uprising uh, of the entire region. The demonstration started to, in March of uh, 2011 and were brutally put down by the uh, monarchy there and ultimately had to do it with the support of Saudi troops and troops from a few other Gulf nations. But that hasn't stopped the demonstrations. I, when I was there on, the, on March 14th, they had a huge demonstration or a couple of demonstrations to mark the anniversary of the uprising. It's basically a uh, uh, movement for democratic rights. For It's not even a movement for the overthrow of the monarchy. The traditional opposition, which at least at the moment has the strongest support, uh, is willing to work with the monarchy. They just want fair elections, a parliament that does something. But the king can still keep many of his powers. In um, uh, conflict with the traditional leadership is a younger, more militant movement that calls for the overthrow of the monarchy, establishing of a parliamentary system. And uh, some of those young people have been turning to uh, throwing Molotovs and other more militant tactics. Uh, they're not the majority, but they're gaining in support as long as the monarchy continues to repress all uh, any kind of demonstrations, whether peaceful or otherwise. Well, Ray Sarlik, we want to thank you for joining us from San Francisco, just back from Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And I also want to thank uh, Reem Turkmani for being with us, a member of the Syrian Civil Democratic Alliance, here in New York, meeting with Security Council members and staff discussing possible political solutions to the situation in Syria. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Back in a minute. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.